Good evening and welcome to Pilgrim Baptist Church's midweek Bible study. Uh, my name is Minister John Lowry, and I am truly delighted to be with here to be with you this evening. Um, I thank God for this opportunity, and I want to thank and give honor to our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Lonnie E. Rector, for allowing me this opportunity to present to you this evening. Uh, tonight's lesson is entitled Serving Love, and it's coming out of the Gospel of John, uh, specifically John chapter 13, uh, verses 1 through 15, and then it drops down to uh, verses 34 and 35. And I would like to read that scripture to you right now in its entirety before we begin our lesson. Again, the Gospel of John chapter 13 verses 1 through 15, and then verses 34 and 35. And I'll be reading from the King James translation this evening. And it reads from verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them until the end. The supper being ended, the devil having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God, and went to God. He riseth from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. And after that he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel, wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, doth thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered him and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said unto him, He that, have, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore he said, Ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye shall do as I have done to you. And then verses 34 and 35. 34 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this all men shall know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one for another. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Again, the title of our lesson for this evening is Serving Love. And by way of introduction, um, John's Gospel was the last of the four Gospels to be written. And what sets John's Gospel apart from the other Gospels is the fact that it often contains, or it does contain, um, many things that the three, uh, what are known as the Synoptic Gospels, do not contain. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the Synoptic Gospels because they are so similar to one another. And John's Gospel, again, has content that's not found in the other three Gospels. It doesn't mean that there's not uh, the telling or the recounting of similar or the same events. Uh, for example, all four Gospels show or all four Gospels include uh, Jesus's uh, miracle of feeding the 5,000 uh, 
with the five loaves of bread and the two fish. But only John's gospel uh, contains Jesus's discourse on he being the bread of life. And so it's also interesting to know that John's is the only of the gospel of the four that does not um, record the institution of the Lord's Supper on the night that Jesus was betrayed. In our lesson text for this evening, which um, talks about Jesus's act of washing the disciples' feet, uh, is only found in the Gospel of John. Uh, when you look at John chapter 13, uh, chapter 13 begins what is commonly referred to as the Upper Room Discourse. And this Upper Room Discourse are uh, a total of five chapters, uh, chapters uh, 13 through 17, um, that where Jesus shares his most intimate thoughts with his disciples, uh, knowing that he was about to die, knowing that he was about to go to the cross, uh, knowing that his disciples were going to feel lost without him, that they were going to be uh, disillusioned, that they were going to be uh, panicked and fearful, and they were going to scatter. Um, Jesus wanted to make sure that he gave them uh, some of his deepest and strongest instructions, if you will. Amen. And so it's in these five chapters, beginning with chapter 13, where Jesus teaches his disciples, uh, his 12 um, closest disciples, amen, who would later be called apostles. He teaches them things about service, um, how to serve with love, which is what we're uh, focusing on this evening. Um, love in general. Uh, the importance of love to a disciple and the fact that love is the identifier of um, our discipleship. Um, he also pre presents the Holy Spirit or the Comforter and the important role that it's going to play in the life of his uh, disciples. Um, he also talks about our union with Christ um, and he confirms the fact that he and the Father are one. And then in chapter 13, um, chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 17 contains what is known as the high priestly prayer, uh, where Jesus just pours his heart out to his Father in heaven. Uh, he prays for the church. He prays for his disciples, um, not only his disciples at that time, uh, but for disciples future, um, including you and I, and those who will come after us. And so all of this, uh, chapters 13 through 17 actually occur on the night that Jesus uh, was betrayed, on that Thursday night uh, before he goes to the cross. And so Jesus knew the hearts of the 12 disciples, and he knew um, that immediately after he instituted the Lord's Supper, Supper and announced that someone would betray him, uh, that the disciples were going to get into this silly, uh, arrogant argument about which one of them would be the greatest. And again, this argument is not captured in John's gospel, but Luke does a really good job of recording that in uh, Luke chapter 22. And so just as Jesus, um, you know, knew what was about to happen, uh, he decided that he was going to give the 12 disciples a lesson in humility. And so when we look at our lesson text and we look at uh, the first three verses of chapter 13 and reading them again, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Um, Jesus knew that it was his time to, to be glorified. He knew it was his time to die. And so many times, uh, especially in the Gospel of John, um, in the first 12 chapters, uh, we saw many references to Jesus saying, uh, either to his disciples or to someone who he healed, that um, you shouldn't say anything or do anything because my hour has not yet come or it's not my time yet. And so what John was alluding to was the fact that um, Jesus was on a divine timeline. Amen. And so it was carefully um, orchestrated and planned out by the Father, um, the events that would unfold um, before Jesus would be crucified, buried, and then rise again on the third day. 
Verse 1 also talks about the fact that he knew that he was about to depart from this place um, and that he loved his disciples. Uh, he loved them with all his heart and he was going to continue to love them um, until the end. Amen. Verse 2 says that um, supper had ended and the devil had put into the heart of Judas uh, to betray Jesus. Amen. And then finally in verse 3, it says that uh, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things unto his hand, that he was to come from God and went to God. Amen. And so um, knowing that the Father had given all things unto his hands uh, is signifying the fact that Jesus was in complete control, that Jesus had full authority over um, all that had transpired in his three years of ministry, and he had complete control over about what was uh, about to um, occur. Amen. That no man took his life, that they put him in front of the kangaroo court, um, in front of uh, Caiaphas and, and um, the other officials, Pilate. Amen. And Jesus allowed that to happen. Amen. He allowed them to um, mock him and to beat him. He allowed them to uh, nail him to the cross. Amen. Because this was all according to uh, the scriptures. And this was all according to uh, God's providential plan uh, for the redemption and the reconciliation of man back to God. And so Jesus knew what was about to happen. Amen. Verses four. Now, in verse four, um, this is where it gets interesting. And this is where the crux of our lesson uh, begins tonight. Uh, it says that Jesus uh, rose from supper, uh, didn't say anything, didn't announce anything. Uh, he took off his outer garments. He took a towel and he girded himself. And after that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. And so um, if you could just uh, be a fly on the wall back then, um, you can only imagine the shock and the look on the faces of the 12 disciples as Jesus stood up without a word and proceeded to uh, prepare himself to wash his disciples' feet. Amen. And it says that in verse five, he took the basin full of water. Um, he used a towel, which he girded himself, and he began to wipe his disciples' feet. And so in order to put this in concept or in context, rather, uh, it's helpful to understand that in the first century Jerusalem, um, the roads were extremely dirty and dusty. Amen. And because men primarily wore sandals back then, um, it was not unlike their, unlike, uh, for their, it was not unusual for their feet to be constantly covered with dirt and other undesirable uh, substances, if you will. And so before they would sit down to dinner, um, whoever was hosting the dinner, um, the master of the house, uh, would bring out a servant, or in most cases, it was a slave. And this slave performed this uh, very, very menial, uh, lowly task of washing the, feast, uh, the feet of the guests. Amen. And so this task was considered to be uh, both customary, but also necessary for uh, the hygiene of the guests. Amen. And so, um, again, the host provided a slave or a servant uh, to do the foot washing because it was considered one of the lowest, uh, dirtiest tasks that anyone could do. Amen. And so, which is why it was, it was done by a servant. But here we have in verse five, uh, the son of God, um, the one who came down through 40 and two generations, um, you know, the one who walked on water, the one who uh, performed all kinds of miracles, gave sight to the blind and and uh, told the winds and the waves to be still. Um, you know, the one who is 100 percent God and 100 percent man, uh, he would humble himself and take on the work of a slave or a lowly servant. Amen. And so, again, the the uh, the apostles or the, the disciples at the time had to be very uh, shocked and dismayed about what they were seeing. And when you read verse six, um, you know, it, it, it tells me that Peter was the last of the 12 to be washed. 
And so by the time uh, Peter had watched Jesus washing the other 11 disciples, uh, Jesus had got to him. Uh, uh, Peter was probably a little beside himself. And he said, Lord, he said, you know, what are you doing? You're going to wash my feet. And Jesus said in verse seven that um, you're not going to understand what I'm going to do now, but at some point you would. Amen. And so as we advance to verse eight, Peter said to uh, Jesus that you'll never wash my feet because Jesus, I'm sorry, Peter didn't fully understand. Uh, once again, we see Peter speaking out of ignorance because he didn't fully understand the purpose of what Jesus was doing. But then Jesus caught uh, Peter's attention in verse eight when he said that if I don't wash you, then you have no part of me. And so Peter in verse nine, um, knowing that he loves the Lord, um, truly loves the Lord, and um, he is devoted to the Lord. Uh, Peter says, again, not fully understanding, well, Lord, don't wash just my feet, but wash my hands and my head. And so um, what, P, what, what Jesus is doing here, um, yes, it has a hygiene um, aspect to it and it has a customary aspect to it, but Jesus was teaching uh, his disciples a lesson. Uh, first and foremost, he was, there was a spiritual connotation to what Jesus was doing. And so by the washing of the feet, uh, Jesus, uh, it was symbolic of Jesus washing of the disciples spiritually clean. Amen. And so when Peter says, you know what, don't wash just my feet, but wash my hands and my, and my head, Jesus says in verse 10 that um, you've already been washed. You've been washed from head to toe, talking about the fact that he's been washed in the Holy Spirit. Uh, that, that he um, has received salvation through his faith in Jesus Christ. And what Peter, what, what Jesus is telling Peter that is that that uh, bodily washing, that, that symbolic spiritual cleansing only has to be done once unto salvation and that the effects of that wash is permanent. But because um, we are still uh, walking this earth and he's referring to Peter, and not only Peter, but us, because that we're still in this world uh, and we're still in the flesh, that occasionally we are going to mess up. And occasionally we're going to have to go to the Lord and confess our sins and get a spiritual washing um, or a um, symbolic washing of our feet. Amen. In the way of um, having our sins forgiven. Amen. And so, you know, John alludes to this in uh, his first epistle, First uh, John 1 and 9, when he said that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. And so the other thing that Jesus is, is trying to demonstrate to his disciples uh, will be revealed in the um, next few uh, verses. Amen. But then he points something out in verse 10. <clears throat> There's 12 men in the room and Jesus uh, is telling Peter that you're already clean spiritually. Amen. Because you've already been washed and, and cleansed uh, because of your faith in me. But there's someone in this room who's not cleansed at all. Uh, never was, never will be. Um, never had any part of me and never will. Um, because he's talking about um, he's talking about Judas, of course. Uh, Judas who would betray uh, Jesus. Amen. And so moving on to the next slide, looking at verses 12 through 15, it says in verse 12 that after he had washed their feet, basically Jesus got dressed and sat down again with them and, and asked them a rhetorical question. Uh, Do you know what I've done to you? Uh, knowing that they didn't understand or comprehend what he did. And Jesus said to them in verse 13, uh, you call me master and Lord, and, and you're right, I am. And so what I've just given you is an example in humility, amen, that if I, as your Lord and, and master, um, if I, as, the, uh, as God incarnate, uh, the son of God and the son of man, uh, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, uh, if I can humble myself and get down on my hands and knees and gird myself and wash your nasty, stinking feet, then, you know, there's no task that's beneath you and that you ought to do uh, the same for one another. You ought to wash one another's feet out of love for me 
in love for one another. Uh, because in verse 15, he's alluding to the fact that um, this is an example I expect you to follow as my disciples. Amen. And so uh, the lesson drops down to verse 34. And, but before we read 34 and 35, I want to back up a little bit. Um, although John did not institute or did not record the institution of the Lord's Supper, uh, we do know that, in fact, that took place this evening. And there are some churches and some denominations that actually include foot washing as part of its uh, observance of communion or the Lord's Supper. Uh, but that really was not the purpose of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Amen. Uh, the purpose was really twofold. First, I've already alluded to the fact that um, you know, Jesus wasn't creating a new custom or a new tradition of washing feet. He was demonstrating an act of humble service. Amen. And this was what he wants his disciples to repeat. And this is what he wants us to do. Uh, he wants us to serve one another with love. And so Jesus said, he alluded to the fact, he said, uh, I came not to be served, but to serve. Amen. And so as disciples of Christ, we must follow suit. And then Jesus gave us an example that really sums up his entire ministry. Amen. That we as disciples of Christ are called to be servants in the likeness of Jesus. Amen. And so um, Jesus expects us to serve and again, serve one another with love. Uh, the other thing that Jesus was doing by washing the feet of his disciples is he was really pointing to his death on the cross and his resurrection. Um, the washing of the feet with water uh, was symbolic of our being of, of us who eventually would become washed white as snow by the blood of Christ. Amen. And so moving on to 34 and 35. Um, the, the, the disciples have already received that lesson in humility. And so now it's time for them to really um, learn uh, this final lesson that Jesus really wants to drive home, that everything that we do in Jesus's name should be done in love. Amen. And so in 34 and 35, Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. One and uh, try that again. I'm sorry. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved one as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. Amen. And so Jesus had just demonstrated genuine serving love to his disciples. And so now he gives a charge to his disciples that they must love one another. And I think it's important to point out that um, this is not optional. This is not a suggestion, amen, but a command that in order for us to be disciples of Christ, we have to display the genuine love of Christ. And this command was one that would make his disciples stand out uh, from the world so that the world would know that they are, in fact, disciples of Christ. Amen. And that's how the world would identify them and is how the world identifies us today. And so the disciples who later would be called apostles would be identified by their ability to love like Jesus, to genuinely love by Jesus. Um, so they would be known by their love, not by their preaching and teaching, um, not by the miracles that God would permit them or allow them to perform uh, during their apostolic ministry, but it was the ability to love that would set them apart. And they were not to love just in a old way. They were to love as Jesus had loved them. Amen. They were to love each other unconditionally as Jesus had done. And I think it's important to note that going back to the, to, the, to the washing of the feet, that Judas was still among them at that time. Um, he had not yet departed. Amen. And so Jesus washed 24 feet and two of those feet belonged to Judas. Amen. And so that means that Jesus washed the feet of the man who would betray him that very evening. Amen. And, and so there's no doubt in my mind that Jesus washed Jesus' feet 
with the same tender love and care that he did the other 11 disciples. And in spite of what Jesus was about to, or what Judas was about to do, uh, Judas was about to commit the, the, the greatest unspeakable sin, and that was to betray uh, the Lord and Savior, uh, the Son of God. Jesus still loved him because he was Jesus's creation, amen? And so how many of us um, as disciples of Christ uh, with the command to love one another could love someone under those circumstances, knowing that that person was about to lead to our death, knowing that that person was about to do harm to us, amen? Um, a new commandment that we love one another as Jesus loved us. Also note that when Jesus said this was a new commandment, uh, he wasn't saying it was a new concept that he was introducing because Jesus preached about love and demonstrated love during his three plus years ministry. And we know that God demonstrated his love for Israel in the Old Testament. Amen. What Jesus was saying was that love would take on a new meaning because of what he was about to do on the cross. Amen. And so discipleship is all about love. Our relationship with Christ is all about love. Our relationship with God through our relationship with Jesus Christ is all about love. God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. Jesus so loved the world that he accepted a horrific death on the cross. And I think it's interesting to note that uh, when you look at the Gospel of John and you look at the first 12 chapters, uh, you'll see the word love 12 times. But from chapter 13 on, it's used 44 times. And so love is that true evidence that we belong to Jesus and that we truly are his disciples. And love goes hand in hand with humble service and acts of humility because everything that we do for one another, everything that we do uh, for, for anyone, um, should be done in love. And so true love, again, is the evidence that we belong to Jesus. Uh, not only just being able to love, but to love someone regardless of who they are or, or what they are or, or what they did to us. And we show our love for Jesus by our genuine love and service to others and to one another. And the world won't know us by our love if we don't show that love through our service. Amen. And it's not easy to love sometimes, but Jesus never said that it would be. You see, Jesus loves us in, in spite of our ugliness, in spite of our, our sinful nature, in spite of our, our rebellious ways. Um, he loves us despite our, our, our disobedience, and he loves us unconditionally. And so Jesus has just one expectation of us as his disciples. And that's to mirror his love, uh, to uh, genuinely um, imitate his love, um, and that we love one another as he loved us, because it's by this that the world will know that we are his disciples. Amen. And so as we wrap up the lesson, uh, three key points that I want to bring out to you before I end. Uh, first, there's no form of ministry or service that's beneath us. And I think I might have mentioned that a couple slides ago, but uh, serving with love, you know, our, our lesson title. Sometimes that means that we're going to have to get our hands dirty. Amen. And, and, you know, to serve others with love, sometimes it means that we have to, to remove those, those things that hinder us from serving one another. Amen. Uh, we seem to put boundaries on what we're willing to do or limitations on what we're uh, willing to do uh, in love. And so Jesus had no boundaries, right? Um, again, he, he was worthy of all our praise and our glory. Um, he is divine. Uh, he is um, a deity. Um, he is both a man and God. Amen. And, but yet he humbled himself and did the task of a slave. And so we should have no ifs, ands, or buts about doing anything uh, for the body of Christ or for the advancement of the kingdom. Amen. And so unfortunately, there's people in the church that believe that there are certain tasks that are beneath them. Amen. And so, you know, they think that 
uh, that they as individuals are too important to be bothered with certain functions or for certain tasks or, or certain ministries, or they think that it would be undignified for, for someone with their title to perform uh, a menial task because they're, they're a deacon or they're a minister or they're a trustee or, you know, they're the, the uh, president of, of a certain ministry, the president of the missionaries, amen. And what Jesus is showing us and trying to teach us that, again, there, there's nothing, no ministry, no service that would be beneath us, amen. And so his, his feet washing, his gesture uh, shows that, um, you know, love prevails, uh, humility prevails, and that we should serve one another with both love and humility which is a good segue into bullet number two. Te Jesus teaches us to be humble in our service. And so Jesus, again, the son of God, performed the task that usually was reserved for the lowliest of servants or slaves. And so what we learn from this example is that our acts of love must be completely selfless, uh, that we must be humble in our service, that we must be humble in our actions, amen, that we should think less of ourselves. Um, and think more of others, okay? And I'm not talking about putting ourselves down. I'm talking about thinking of ourselves less often and thinking of others more often, amen? And, and so, you know, the disciples didn't think to wash uh, each other's feet, amen? And so, as I said earlier, it's the customary that the host uh, provides the servant or the slave. In this particular case, the disciples were their own hosts because uh, Jesus had sent them ahead to find a place where they could celebrate uh, their Passover meal together. And so there was no servant to wash the feet. Amen. And so knowing that the the uh, disciples lacked humility, amen, because it was just a moments later that they were arguing about who was going to be the greatest, um, you know, showing that they had no no humility whatsoever. Um, and so the disciples didn't think, hey, you know what, somebody needs to wash the feet, I ought to do this. And, and I believe that's one of the reasons why Peter was so upset about the thought of Jesus washing his feet. I, I think deep down inside, he felt bad about Jesus washing his feet because he knew that he should have done it for the Lord out of love. He should have been willing to um, wash Jesus's feet. Amen. But none of the disciples thought about it. Amen. And so we need to be humble in our service. In fact, humility is one of, of Jesus's greatest qualities. And, and it's one that we should try to emulate uh, throughout our lifetime as disciples of Christ. And then finally, uh, Jesus teaches us the importance of sacrifice. Uh, the verses say that when Jesus washed his disciples' feet, he cast aside his garments, amen? And the only other time in the scripture where his garments were cast aside was when he humbled himself unto death on the cross, amen? And so Jesus told his disciples, what I'm doing, you do not understand now, but you will uh, know this or understand this by and by. And so it, it really had nothing to do with the foot washing act, but it was all about uh, uh, demonstrating acts of humility and demonstrating act of, uh, of service, uh, love with service or servicing love uh, with one another. Amen. And so we as his disciples, uh, if we are true disciples, we will follow Jesus's example. Amen. And so this concludes our lesson for this evening. Um, I pray that you heard something that you can take away from this lesson this evening that might aid you in your Christian walk. Amen. And so once again, I want to I thank God for this opportunity to uh, be with you this evening. And once again, I thank Pastor Rector for this opportunity. Amen. And so, uh, Pilgrim, until we meet again, may God continue to bless you and keep you. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's once more and again that we come before your throne of grace, Lord, thanking you for this opportunity to gather in your word, to gather in your name, to study your word. Father, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you for uh, the example set by your son, Father. Lord, we pray that uh, you help us to continue to grow in our faith and grow in our Christian maturity, Lord, that we might continue to strive to be like Jesus, Father, that we will serve one another with love and with humility. 
Father, we thank you for our pastor. We thank you for uh, Sister Rector. Uh, we thank you for uh, the ministry that they continue to uh, bring forth, even in the time of pandemic and isolation, Lord, that um, the message still goes out through YouTube and, and through Zoom. Uh, so we just thank God. We ask you to continue to bless our pastor, uh, that he might continue to have the strength and, and, and the uh, know-how to continue to serve under these difficult times, Lord, that you'll continue to uh, strengthen him, Lord, uh, and to lead, guide, and direct him, Father. And now, Lord, as we prepare to depart from this, this, uh, this lesson, but never, ever, ever from your presence, we ask you to go with us, be with us, and guide us. And we'll be careful to give you all the glory, honor, and praise that's yours and yours alone. It's in the matchless and majestic name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Let every heart say, Amen. Have a great evening. Take care. And may God keep you until we meet again. Good night.